Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for May. Because we've had um, May the 4th, which is Star Wars Day. You know. And so we're moving into May the 5th, which is apparently the day of the Sith. I don't know why we need to... I mean, what's May the 6th going to be? I have no idea at all. Um... And it's been exciting because most lots of things have been going into digital. We've just had, you know, the old Star Wars film <laughs> moving into digital. Disney Plus is doing everything digital. People are playing about with Animal Crossing. People can't get together face to face. So everything is going a bit digital. So if you're going to be bringing in somebody to talk digital when it comes to analog tabletop, there is only one person to talk about <laughs> and talk to. But Mandy wasn't available, so joining me again, I've got <laughs> Suzanne Sheldon. Hello. Oh, hello, Richard. Thank you for that. I'll just call it introduction. <laughs> right, it's like all the bait and switch. The old bait and switch. Right up to the last minute, and then woof. It's away. It's well, away. Let's face um, it, anybody you, in their right mind would pick Mandy over me on almost any topic. That's, so, I understand. That's not... That's the, Don't be... That's not true at all, um, you know... Because um, I asked Mandy and she said no. So there you go. So at least you said yes. No, that's not true either because I haven't, <laughs> I, Lies I haven't and asked deceit. her. So she's even further down the list because I even bothered to even to message her and say, hey, do you fancy coming on the show? That's how ignorant I am. <laughs> ignorant. Absolutely ignorant. Um, <clears throat> it's really funny because I am going to do a little bit of way back, way back clock because we, <laughs> when we spoke last time, we were talking about kind of... Um, you know, adventures, uh, adventures in the north of England, and for both, for whatever reason, um, that didn't happen for either of us. And then all of a sudden, um, March said, "Oh, you think this is bad? Hold my beer," and kind of went for it. And now we're in this situation where things are just a little bit topsy turvy. Up is down, left is right. Quantum's going all spearmint and peppermint when it should be good doing something else entirely. But um, how's yourself, first of all? How are you doing? <laughs> I, I think the podcast appropriate response is, I'm doing great. I think the real response is, <laughs> this is rough, Richard. This is really, yeah. really rough. I try to maintain the perspective that I am blessed in so many ways, and I definitely have it a lot better than hmm. even some of my good friends. So I try to maintain that perspective. But let's let's keep it real. You know, this is not easy. Uh, it's not easy for anybody, I can imagine. And so I'm I'm just like everybody else. How about you? It's been strange. It's kind of been quite liberating in some ways and also kind of difficult in a lot of other ways mm -hmm. um it's been a difficult it's actually been it's been a pretty difficult couple of days because um and and it's just a simple thing it's like it's my son's my middle son's birthday and he lives with his mum and their um and her husband and with my eldest and it was his birthday on Monday, on, on, on the 4th. And I went and saw him, but because we're not in the same, <laughs> we're not living together, I had to say happy birthday to him and be within, like, couldn't be within any closer than a couple of metres to him, which was tough. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like one of those things that's like, I wanted to say happy birthday, give him a big hug, and I went, 
I don't know because I could have touched any number of things on the way in here and then by me kind of going up and giving you a hug and if folk are being like paranoid and it's like it's not that it's like I couldn't be the person that if somebody then says oh well how are they feeling oh I'm not feeling that great and then it's like well is that me kind of thing so that was it's like little things like that that are kind of like bringing it home it's not I got used to going to the I've got used to going to the um to the I'll call it Americanize it the store to buy groceries. Wow, very yeah. very American. Um you're 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 welcome, ma'am. And um <laughs> so that has kind of almost become people are very accepting over here in the UK. We've accepted that every it's really strange. It's like everybody is kind of accepting that we're gonna have to spend a little bit of distance apart. So when we're queuing at the supermarket to get in People queue. There's not anybody kind of jumping in. There's not anybody kind of. People are keeping their kind of their space and their kind of their distance and stuff like that. Um. So that and but it's it's easily become a norm. You go around. You get your shopping. You get out again. You get home. You make sure you wipe everything down that's been on the supermarket shelves before you put it in your cupboards, kind of thing. So it's it's very easy, isn't it? Very easy for humans to kind of make the most exciting things extremely take it down to a level of banality where it almost becomes <laughs> the kind of the norm um, but on other sides it's, just, it's a real struggle kind of like just knowing that I can't just go somewhere and just chill hang out, do stuff you know, it's kind of weird for sure and I know that's a long answer I am, I work from home primarily and I have a number of friends mm-hmm. that work from home as well so that adjustment was very, quite easy in that respect. But what hmm. we are even realizing is, yeah, we may enjoy being home and we may be used to it, but all of a sudden that extra, you can't go or you shouldn't go. Yeah. That mental yeah. twist, it, it feels different. It's amazing how even if substantively things are very similar, it just, it feels different. And I think that that's something that everybody's dealing with on on a varying level, for sure. It's kind of, I don't know, it's highlighted for me um, the kind of the cultural differences between the UK and the US. Well, especially Scotland, I mean, Scotland and the the US and the fact that we're kind of, we're quite accepting of it and we realise that we have to get through it and we're getting through it as best as we can, but... We're not seeing the kind of the level of people going, you are taking away my kind of rights and stuff. I was just, just, it just kind of baffles me because it seems to be, I don't understand. And I, I guess, um, you know, in speaking to kind of a few of my American friends, they're just like, well, there is a big, huge thing about kind of like um, who's controlling your life and stuff like that. And it's drilled into people that you don't want any type of government control. And that's why people are kind of rebelling against it but to be honest see if if we had people in scotland kind of going well i'm gonna you know i'm gonna get in people's faces and not wear masks we would you know they would be they'd be putting their arse (laughs) to be honest (laughs) to be getting a slap they'd be getting a slap across the back of the head and been told to kind of like you know jog on son you know i mean otherwise i'll tell your mother what you've been up to kind of thing it's just it's just there's kind of it's not social responsibility it's just that i wouldn't expect if i was standing in that queue waiting to get into the store that somebody would kind of barge in and start explaining you know start shouting and protesting that they should have the right to stand within two meter you know two two feet of me and start breathing down my face and stuff i would just you know people would People would get people would lamp them if they did that in Scotland, which is kind of like a weird. Is it? I mean, I don't know. I mean, have you seen much of that? Are you kind of like with you having been at, staying at home and you know checking on with the kids and stuff like that? Have you kind of have you seen any kind of that yourself, or is it sensationalized by the news across here? I mean, is it something that you know there's a very kind of angry vocal minority and it's not happening as much as what the the media would like us to say it is? I think it's really regional in in some Mm. ways. I mean, certainly anywhere you go, you're going to have people that feel that way. And for sure, there's something in Mm. uh, the American genome about perceived rights and what having a right Mm -hmm. versus a responsibility is. But Mm -hmm. 
a lot of the places that you see are they have clusters of of groups that prefer to operate in a single-minded way. And so locally yeah. here, you don't see huge organizations like that, but I think that that's also a privilege of where I happen to live in the Seattle, Washington area, where this is a tech-centered yeah, area yeah. in many, many ways. A lot of people were already working remotely. Uh, we have mm-hmm. uh, city centers that are hugely privileged areas with a lot of white-collar workers. Uh, and I think that you that's why we some of the reasons we see less of that revolt here Mm -hmm. um but america the united states is a large large country and every state every region is got its nuance and so i think the area i'm in doesn't necessarily that that hasn't been a huge issue here Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. uh some of the stories you see on the news are true and they do happen. And um, I wish it was otherwise. I think I, I don't want to get, you know, it's, it's the thing I, I was just thinking about this earlier today. There's a, a story. A lot of people are saying, well, people are going to die anyway. We can't avoid deaths. Hmm. The virus is already out there. People are going to die anyway. We can't let our economy collapse um, because of some deaths that are going to happen anyway. And I won't comment on that. But what I will say is I think that, that is, we're setting the bar quite, quite low. I, I've read plenty of accounts of people who've had the disease at this point and survived because there are people surviving. Absolutely. And that's absolutely something that is worth discussing more, in my opinion. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the people who have it and have to be hospitalized for it, this is not a disease you want to get. Even if you're in a low risk, like this is a miserable disease. The treatment is brutal to your body and the long term ramifications to like your lung capacity and your your overall healthy system is devastating. (laughs) So I, I, I hear these discussions about, well, in at least in the United States, there's a lot of like, well, the economy collapsing will kill more people than the disease will. And I understand that. But maybe that's that's true maybe that's not i don't research things like that but i do know that i do not want to get this disease even if i'm not in a high risk group of death because it sounds yeah, yeah, yeah. terrible so i'd i personally i i'd like the bar to be a little higher for for it i mean um i mean i've got i've got young you know my youngest is he's only 7 um, we both got obviously we both got kids. Have you how have you dealt with the kind of like the discussions with them? Are you being kind of honest in their questions? We we just I mean with with our youngest we're just trying to like be kind of if he has questions about it we're trying to kind of manage how they are you know how they're kind of answered not kind of even sugarcoat it but just you know kind of be kind of quite matter of fact and uh, and part of me wants to say well I want to protect him from potentially what is actually out there and and part of me is kind of like saying well I don't want to kind of make up some kind of airy fairy story and he's probably better understanding kind of like a lot of a lot of the basic stuff I mean have you have you have you kept it quite real when you've been discussing it with with your with your kids or how have you handled that yeah I think honesty is important I don't think I think with kids kids have active imaginations and they do overhear things Mm -hmm. through popular culture and social media and things like that, depending on what access they have. And I think there's Mm -hmm. enough information out there that sensationalizes it. And I want to balance that where Mm -hmm. we're being honest, but I don't need to instill fear in my children. That's not my job. And so being pragmatic and helping them understand our role as healthy individuals for our community and for our family and why that's important on a small and a large scale is kind of where I focus my messaging. You have grandparents that they love and dearly that are considered high risk. Well, we would never want to be responsible for infecting them or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we don't want to get sick ourselves because it's not a fun disease and that, Everybody is somebody's mother or brother or sister or or family member, and 
as a community, this is how we work together as a community to help each other. And kind of that's where I kind of mm-hmm. try to focus my messaging. And that overall seems to work with them. And, and when they talk about when they hear something maybe about people dying or or things like that. I do try to balance that with people are recovering and we are doing mm-hmm. what we should be doing by staying home as much as we can and making smart decisions about mask wearing or not going out or uh, hand washing and and so forth and and that's that's honestly for my children who are eleven and eight now that seems to be okay yeah. they seem to get it really it's just yeah. the practical day-to-day thing about being quarantined not being able to go to playgrounds because here our state parks and our local parks are closed and trying to adapt to the schooling from home has been a real real challenge so the disease itself is what it is and they seem to understand that it's how that impacts their lives and their activities, they understand it, but that adjustment's been very, very challenging. I'm just finding with the homeschooling that um, it's it's kind of tough because they're used to being uh, they're used to being in a kind of a situation where they interact with other kids, but also the work itself takes an awful lot longer to do. Because when they're assigned a piece, you know, it takes like, you know, so when I'm explaining something to Jake and saying, right, okay, we're going to, here's a list of numbers and I want you to add these all together, but I want you to then draw them on a line and show me where in the, where in the line these numbers would appear. I can explain it. I'm explaining it in a way that I know he understands. So he gets it straight away. And obviously, and sometimes in teaching what, you know, you're, you're explaining this concept to a room of 25 kids who have different kind of learning abilities and so what we're finding and I don't know if you're seeing this is that the the working day the school working day is considerably shorter when you're kind of doing the one-on-one kind of tuition and at the beginning we were thinking well you know because myself and both myself and my my wife are kind of involved in, in this but we're finding that we're having you're having to do almost extra to kind of keep that keep that going because we're both working we're both working from home my my, um, my my wife's like a she's involved in like kind of social care and stuff like that so she's dealing with some of them some of the people who are really really struggling in this and I deal you know I'm dealing I'm doing nothing which provides value I do consultancy <laughs> to help people sell on Amazon which is kind of like keeping it's a but that has gone that has gone through the roof it's so busy at the moment everybody now is deciding that they need to buy and sell stuff on Amazon it's just it's absolutely ridiculous but at the same time it's kind of getting that balance where he'll come through and say it's like here do that task and then 10 minutes later he's like oh I've done it now what do I do now yeah and I don't know if you've seen that yourself that you know because we because we get sent the work every 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 evening we get a message through the online app and they use this wonderful online i can't i can't praise the teachers high enough for the kind of the job that they're doing because they're trying to still engage with the kids and you know my my son's teachers reading them stories but you know in terms of setting out the work it's just like it's not running into a full day, which is then in, impacting on other people's, you know, our ability to kind of work from home. So are you, as I say, you're, you say you're finding that to be the case then? Yeah, we're really vacillating. Um, for example, yesterday, Monday, from the day that we're recording, both of my kids woke mm-hmm. up motivated. They jumped on their computer. Yeah. They logged into similarly a computer system that our school district has set up and got their assignments uh-huh. done. And boom, it was 11 a.m. and they were totally done with everything. And yeah. Yeah. that's on one hand, great. On the other hand, then it was, I'm bored, I'm hungry, what can I do now? Mm. And mm-hmm. just like you, I have a job and I need to keep keep working and yeah. finding that balance is tough. On the other hand, then we have days like I've had so far today where the kids woke up and they are completely unmotivated and getting them to do their schoolwork has been an argument. And that's 
troublesome in a different way, right? Because instead of finding times to fill their time after they've been productive, now you're wasting time trying to motivate them to get them to be productive. And there's more emotional stress and kind of pushing against resistance on that front. And so far for the past three weeks that this remote schooling has been going on, or two weeks and two days, that seems to, we just can't get into a rhythm. Uh, they have good days and they have rough days. And yeah. ugh, I, the good days have their troubles. I don't and know if the rough days have their troubles. There's no winning, really. I don't know. I don't know if it's like, if it's even like, a, it's a mental health, if there's a slight mental health thing there as well. Oh, there has to be. Because if you be. can imagine, you're going. You know, if you're going from being, you know, imagine, I mean, even for me, it's like some days it's like, it is fantastic being at home. It is fantastic waking up, you know, an hour and a half sometimes later than I'm used to getting up, not having to worry about the stress of driving the car into work or, and all that, that and everything that's involved with that, not having to take an hour to get home and then not have something to eat for dinner for another half an hour after that kind of thing. But also at the same time, there is the little things, like I said earlier on, like just being in a different place, being around my work colleagues. And I'm just thinking, well, my kids are used to, you know, and I've got my two eldest, one of them, they were doing their exams, the big important exams yeah. as well. So That's those so exams right. got scrapped. So they're now relying on, you know, something else. But I'm, you know. My youngest, he's missing out on this kind of brownie emotion of being around with his friends and other kids and all the experiences, and we don't know how that's going on. And I'm just wondering if that's maybe an effect. And I understand the structure, but I'm starting to think of, well, do I just, if he's not up for it, do I just kind of push him a little bit and then just let and just say, right, okay, you you kind of be a kid for a day and do kind of muck around and stuff like that. Because you are learning, you are getting your stuff done. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know as well, and and I've had that thought too. It's it's and my children are younger, at eleven and and eight. Mm. Arguably, in some ways, there's less at stake. They don't have critical exams that they're not going to get into university if yeah. they don't do well on that kind of thing. I mean, certainly there are building blocks, mm -hmm. basic fundamentals that they should be learning right now that are critical in a different way. But yeah. I don't know. If if somebody has a definitive answer, I'd love to hear it. That is for sure. <laughs> so was the um cuz you're doing this fascinating series on Twitter <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Which um I noticed that you've 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 cleverly entitled Day Whatever of School Closure. And um and I think it's it's important work. You know, I think if you can't express it in kind of two hundred and eighty characters, then what can you what can you do? But was it just did it start off as I'm gonna just gonna do this as a as a kind of this will be interesting to do, and is it now a case of I need I need to express myself on how I'm actually feeling at the moment because I'm just looking today at you know say, um, day thirty five for instance, <laughs> <laughs> is literally is quite literally. Face palm, face palm. It's literally there is about the best part of maybe sixty or seventy face palms interject with kind of like some slightly angry emojis. Yeah. So is that a point where you could actually you can actually physically type? <laughs> I can physically type or communicate. I've just got to express my emotions here. For sure, I I think that I've always used social media as an outlet. Uh, to varying degrees mm -hmm. and yeah i i've you know i see a lot of posts or articles or headlines about hey i'm i finally reorganized my pantry or i'm learning how to bake or i find i finally have time to read a book and the reality is for me not to over dramatize it but Every day is just a matter of survival. It's a matter of yeah. by the skin of my fingertips clawing my way through the day. And that's, quite frankly, that's even on good days. 
there's just, there's no easy day for me. I see my friends sometimes that maybe don't have kids that are saying, oh, I'm bored, which I can understand why that's problematic, but I don't hmm. understand the concept of being bored anymore. I, I'm never bored. <laughs> I always have 30 things I could or should be doing at any given time. Now, I understand being overwhelmed, yeah. but being bored, yeah. it's just not in my my universe. So I started that post just because literally on the first day of school, just all these little things were happening that just made me want to – they were very little things. They were benign things, but they just – kind of cracked me up even in the moment going, oh my gosh, I can't imagine 30 days of this. <laughs> I'm going to capture this moment. <laughs> and then <laughs> be careful what you wish for, or maybe I'm I'm prescient because uh, there are good days and there are bad days. And if nothing else, it'll be something I can look back on to remember. I mean, I hope in five years, ten years, I can look back on this and go, oh, gosh, remember those funny moments. But let's face it. Sometimes there are bad days. And I think people that I know online on social media, they're not necessarily looking for sugar-coated, whitewashed, candy-coated scenarios and having – Knowing that somebody's out there that they can relate to, that they can say, oh, somebody else is struggling. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that when I can see friends that I know that I relate to. And so that's, that's really about, that's really what that thread is. It's a way for me to express myself. And I try not to only capture the happy, sunny, you know, go lucky moments. I try to capture really the moments as they are, maybe with a little bit of humor always thrown in there because if you can't laugh then you're really in trouble yeah yeah i've got i always i have a, a kind of a vision of you waking up in the morning and kind of getting picking up the piece of chalk and just marking another line down the wall <laughs> before before you get up and then doing it mark i've done five now so we can just put the line through the wall and kind of go that's just done another five days kind of thing <laughs> but are you what are you doing to keep yourself going? Kind of, I mean, are you are you making drinking. sure? Because a lot of I, I've spoken, a lot of alcohol. That's I was I didn't want to just kind of like out you like this, <laughs> but you know when you're just like your first thing is all, all I hear is like you doing this, and I'm like, well, what are you doing? And you just said, well, before we start, I'm just lining up the shots. <laughs> What are you doing? I'm doing, te doing, you, you we're doing you tequila you tonight. You wouldn't mention that. Come on, Richard. I, I was just glad you didn't bring off the cocaine. That was all. I'm just, oh. That's all I'm just. That's all I'm just saying. But anyway, um, but you found. Um, but you, obviously, your drug of choice has gone digital, and uh, you're now. Um, and this is interesting because you are talking about obviously the domestic day to day and working from home and looking after the kids. And then you're also involved in this Animal Crossing um, <laughs> <laughs> tobacco. So I don't, because I, 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 look, I, the last time I played Animal Crossing, it was on the DS and it was magnificent. And I remember the turnip rush. <laughs> I, rem I remember, I remember like, you know, the last time I had it was when, you know, um, getting up at like six o'clock or whatever on a, on a Sunday morning, you know, waiting for the the goat woman to come round with her turnips, and you just hoping, you know, you had enough money to buy them at a fair price, and then just every single day, regardless, just checking those turnip prices with a shop just to see if you could get a good thing. But are you, is it are things like Animal Crossing are they like a welcome escape now? I mean, before it was like leisure time, but they're kind of like, yeah, I get, get me something to kind of. Be a bit zen, kind of like, you know, clean out the mind a bit, have a little bit of relaxation. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. It's mm. such a benign little game and it, it's relaxing and weirdly creative. But honestly, I like 
the game. I did not play it in DS form or anything like that. This is really the first real Animal Crossing experience I've had. All right. And cool. I've loved it, but the I'm positive that the only reason I'm enjoying it and got into it as much as I have is because my community has also sunk into it. And we're communicating and rallying around together and collaborating in like Discord groups and Slack chats where they're sharing their experiences or they're sharing their tips. Or if you get that good turnip price, you're traveling to each other's islands and people are complimenting each other and celebrating each other and giving each other items so that your island can look even more amazing. And all of that is great. And in in the weirdest way, you know, we talk about board games and analog games here. There are certain elements to how this Animal Crossing experience is rolling out in the world today that pulls out some mm. of the best things about board gaming for me. It's that shared experience. It's an experience that you center a group around. You experience mm-hmm. it together in personal ways. And you collaborate or compete and share and give and trade and crack jokes and share strategies. And that's what we're doing in Animal Crossing. And I guarantee you that is why I've enjoyed it as much as I had have currently. Because, because the people, go figure. Because everybody's looking for that escape and we all happen to find one together. See when... Um... When they started to kind of like ban kind of public get togethers and stuff like that, were you like kind of like, my time's come? <laughs> Let's, you know, I've been talking about digital representations of tabletop for some time, and here we go. This is it. People are going to ask, and I'm going to deliver. And I'm going to be, I'm going to be classy about it. I'm not going to throw it in people's faces that I was right all along. But, you know, in all fairness, you have been pretty right so far regarding kind of like the digital stuff. Are you, are you kind of like a pioneer? Like, I've been doing this for years now. I am now a pioneer. Have, is, have you have you noticed kind of? Um, I mean, you're you're still playing digital games. I know that for a fact. But have you noticed people that you and were total luddites kind of jumping on the digital train and saying, Suzanne? Teach me, show me the way, kind of thing. <laughs> I I have noticed people that have maybe not spoken about digital games before, or some who have maybe eschewed them before, giving them a try now. And certainly with the network that we have, not just friends in your local playgroup, but people who are working to have a presence in the board game community, working to be influential and making content. People who've kind Mm -hmm. of poo-pooed digital games uh, now jumping in and making content about them and speaking about them. And part of me is really happy about that Mm -hmm. for sure because the more... The more people talking about them, the more people will discover them. And I've always believed that digital board games can be an entree to physical board games for people that wouldn't otherwise know about them. So the more people that discover the digital board gaming world, I have hopes that they'll discover the joys of analog board gaming. But for sure, part of me sometimes looks at some people and go, oh, okay. I see how it is now that. You know, and and I know I have friends who are solo gamers. I solo game, but not to the depth of of some of my other friends. But I've long been an avid solo gamer, and ultimately, digital board mm-hmm, gaming for mm-hmm. me has been essentially solo board gaming. And yeah, I've yeah. seen some solo gamers kind of side eyeing some content creators who have poo pooed solo gaming, but now they're in a situation where they're kind of forced to. And I think they probably feel similarly. There's two sides to that coin. There's a really great side to it. But then the other side of it is always, are people still talking about solo gaming or digital gaming as the lesser option, as the fallback? And that's, for me, a positioning I don't like seeing for digital games or for solo games. Solo games or digital gaming, both are 100% 
legitimate ways to experience games and moving forward, I'm hoping that this will open people up to that a little bit more so that we can talk about them on equal scale and that they're not kind of a last resort. Because for many people already, they're not a last resort. These are preferred ways to play. These are ways that people Mm -hmm. have discovered joy and challenge and fun. And to have people present them as a, ugh, well, now that we have no choice, it's kind of a bummer. And I think that that sets the wrong tone overall. But for people who are discovering digital board games, discovering solely gaming, discovering the world of print and plays, all these wonderful things, that's great. Because all of this is quote unquote board gaming. And yeah, yeah. And that's wonderful. And let's face it, the role playing um, side of the hobby, I mean, with things like Roll 20, um, they, a lot of them were kind of experiencing games on a kind of a digital plane kind of anyway. Um, so in some ways we we are kind of like catching up. I mean, I know a lot of people who play D&D were like going, well, it's not really made a difference because we never usually went around everybody else's house to have a, to continue the campaign. We all just kind of logged into Roll20, don't it? And then kind of away, kind of away we kind of, away we kind of went. Um, which is, you know, which is fine. I mean, what's what's your view on the what what's your kind of the view on the t- kind of the tabletop simulator and the kind of the mod scene? Because I know that there's obviously there's official versions of games that have come out, but one of the things that's come out with, I guess, through necessity is that people have wanted to play games that they have purchased and so some people have spent considerable amounts of time in some cases adding on kind of like board game mods onto, you know, these these digital platforms. Do you think, you I mean, in terms of like official version over bootleg version, I guess, do you think that's justifiable in these times or do you think people should be trying to support the businesses that are, creating the games in the first place i think people should be supporting the designers and publishers who created the games in the first place but Mm -hmm. i also think that the designers and publishers who create these games should understand that this is an opportunity for them and yeah that you know the ideal flow for a passionate fan in my opinion would be I really want to play this game. I have the capability to do it. Reaches out to publisher, says, I have the capability to do this. Can I do it? And the publisher checks them out, says, you know what? I think you can. Sure. I I have seen no evidence that allowing a digital version of your game to exist harms your sales in the physical world. And... There are certain elements like on Tabletop Simulator that it's it's very, very fast to get a game on there. It's very, very simple if you know what you're doing because it's just a physics yeah, engine yeah, and yeah. an object engine. There's no like rules enforcement or things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And let people play your games. Let people discover your games. I will also say that that world, especially in TTS, is extraordinarily small. And you have to maintain the perspective that people who are willing to go to that level to play the games are already fairly deep into the hobby. And that's great. Help people who are already passionate gamers discover your games. Yeah, I did see, I mean, I seen, um, I think I seen some guy on on social media basically say, well, you know, um, I'm, I created this mod so my friends could continue to play um, a certain big game. And he says it's fairly kind of gutted by the fact that he sank so many hours in it only to discover that it had been been kind of taken down. Um, It didn't sound like somebody saying, oh, I never play for these games. I go out and, you know, take a deck of cards down a photocopier and rip off the the kind of the copies. I think these are people that are like playing the latest kind of collectible card game and have discovered that they've had a campaign going and they can't play it with their friends, but now they've then spent the time to so they can play it with their friends. But I'm kinda 
both sides. I think um, I think the t- I think certain people's timing could be better. I think if it'd been the case, it's like when we know well, well, if people are then just using it so they can get kind of like experience of free free games. But I think what what you said is completely correct. Is that yeah, I can play like the captain is dead or whatever on tabletop simulator. But if I like that game so much, I'm you know I want to have a copy of that game on my shelf because I want to touch the pieces and hold the pieces and play around in a kind of a physical, a kind of a physical game itself. Yeah, I so. will also say that there was a recent kind of noticeable effort of a very very large publishing group to pull down TTS modules. There's a few things in play there because if you really are just interested in playing with your friends, you don't have to make modules public. So they're finding the public yeah. modules. So it's not just I think we have to be pretty realistic here. This is not a situation of people just making something for them and their friends that they keep private. They're obviously posting it in a public manner to allow other people access. Now, you can argue that that's generous and they do put a lot of time in it and they want as many people to enjoy it as possible. But but that is beyond, I just want to play the game with my friend. I'm going to use my skill set to do so. And I'll also point out that in some situations, and I'm well familiar with this on a personal level, that when a game involves an outside intellectual property piece, especially pieces of art or other media like movies or books, then if the com- if the publisher that has the license to that to for the game doesn't take action to stop the bootlegging the publisher can get in trouble with the ip owner so let's just yeah. use a very obvious example star wars if you've created a star wars game that's a published game in tts without permission and say fantasy flight doesn't put a stop to it fantasy flight can get in trouble with lucasfilm and yeah. that puts their license at risk. And I don't think it's reasonable to expect a publisher to put their access to that license at risk over a bootleg. Um, and so there's there's also that element to it that I've seen in a couple of instances that I, that as consumers, we kind of forget about sometimes. And I, finding a balance between fair access and growing the industry and things like that, but also not being abusive towards things that publishers don't necessarily even have control over themselves is is important as well. Yeah, it's kind of like we're in and I'm I'm not gonna I'm not going to use that word. The word that starts with you. I'm just gonna say that, you know, we're living in a different place at the moment and um you know, especially for this, this is a new realm of people trying to interact with a hobby. So there's going to be kind of stumbling blocks and and people stumbling and people try to find their feet kind of along their way. Um, In terms of kind of the digital side of things that you're playing, is there anything that's kind of catching your eye that you're kind of, you know, apart from obviously turnip prices and Animal Crossing, um, but is there anything kind of you've been playing a lot and enjoying on the kind of the digital plane? What I've really discovered is that I appreciate full-fledged board game apps that have polished presentation, smooth interaction, and rules enforcement. They are Mm -hmm. so much simpler to play and much more relaxing to play. I've been playing a number of games in both Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia, which are more physics engines than they are interactive games it's they give you all the pieces and you can play the game but you have to know how to play and make you enforce the rules like you would play in a physical game so in in a sense it's more analogous to board gaming in real life but having to go through the extra layer of the interaction how do i zoom in how do i switch views how do i get a closer look at this card how do i pick up this card oops i picked up the whole deck of cards now how do i put the card back into the deck of cards that kind of thing yeah yeah it's stressful yeah. yeah And certainly if you invest enough time, you kind of get used to some of the basics and it gets easier the more you do it. But one of my challenges is I'm playing on both TTS and on Tabletopia and the systems are similar but completely different. So if you want to move the table up or down, 
In one system, it's a right mouse click. In another system, it's a center mouse click. And oh, it's, okay. it's honestly, it's aggravating. And so that's not been the best. That said, I've really enjoyed gaming with distant friends on all of the systems. And in Tabletopia, we I played Traintopia. And I love that game. I haven't even played it. In, I have the physical copy, but I haven't had a chance to play it. I had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the selection in, say, iOS or Steam or Android, those are the games I find I want to turn to because they're just more relaxing to play. And so those are the ones that I'm I'm really, really enjoying. And I'm so glad that there's so many of them out there. I I do wish there were more. <laughs> have you been playing anything digitally? Yes, I have. Not with me. We gotta we, Richard, we gotta get something going on sometime. Right, okay, that's fine. We can do this. Okay. I have been playing there's two games that have been taking up a lot of my time and a lot of my attention at the moment and the first one is uh, the Charters, Charterstone I was going to say Charterstone digital app but that misses out most of the T's um, but the Charterstone digital app by, um, from Stonemaier Games which um, has been fun yes and confusing mm. and needs a bigger screen sometimes just sure. to keep a track of everything sure but I've been enjo- I've been enjoying it gets um it can get quite busy, but also at the same time, it's lovely just to kind of dip into and take your turn. And it's not something, yeah, you can get kind of, re- you can either kind of sit back and kind of get quite relaxed with it and just take your turn and realize what you're doing, or you can get right into it and be checking what everybody else is doing and try to kind of second guess them and everything like that, which is good fun. Um, so I've been kind of enjoying that. I've played through a couple of campaigns and it's kind of it's kind of interesting to me because as everyone's aware, Charterstone's a legacy game. Which kind of means that it's almost like you're putting you're potentially spoiling your own an um your own analog version of the game. Sure. So you know, but then again, this is a case as I was playing. Okay, I was playing. I've been playing Charterstone um, with my um, eldest son, and we can't do that at the moment, um, as I've expressed before. And so, this is a way to allow me to, you know, to experience the game on different levels, and also not have to get the recharge pack. Right. You know, I can yep. play all the different factions as well, and I can restart again. And if I don't like it, I can play like a local game and stuff like that. So I've been kind of enjoying that because it's almost like a very kind of Sim City. It's very gentle. Um, game gets a bit weird in the middle, <laughs> but that's a, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's been fun. Um, the other one has been um, Raiders of the North Sea, mm-hmm. which. Um, I again it's one of these ones that I kind of just dip in dip in and dip out I don't have to sit there and spend an entire evening it's something that I'll just go in and check because it's generally holding your turn and it's a nice little kind of it's a nice little kind of brain burner kind of puzzle one I kind of I tr- you know what I tried Pandemic mm-hmm. and I I kind of didn't get on with it mm. I'll be honest I found it a bit I found that um I ended up kind of doing, I because you can do the thing where they, they kind of highlight the available moves to you, and I ended up kind of thinking less, and actually just trying, just doing the the kind of the first available move that I found because it can be, k- pandemics. What I don't know. There's something about sometimes digital games is I'd like to get my hands on the actual cards and the pieces and actually just have a think to myself while I'm looking at the cards, and sometimes with digital games. I don't feel I've got that contemplation. I generally react a lot quicker and think a lot less, which is probably how I do most things. But, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, but it's been fine. I've not tried to go all out with the digital games. I did. I did get. Um, I did get a chance to play. Um, I did. I got a chance to play a game coming to Kickstarter called Prisma Arena from Hub Games. Ooh. Um, 
So that was, and I played with, um, I played that with Rory, um, and that was fun. I mean, that, and I, I've, and interestingly enough, I've been involved in. I, I got, I, I've played, I played the prototype copy of that game as well. <laughs> so it was interesting to see how, um, it was interesting to see how different the prototype version was, where they were still working on the components, to a digital version where there wasn't the constraint of producing the components in order to make them realistic. Do you know what I mean? You mm-hmm. didn't there were you know, it wasn't a case of, oh, and this one's gonna be like a solid this is gonna be a solid resin marker or this is gonna be this cube. It was a case of if they wanted to make that within tabletop simulator, they could just produce the asset to do that, which I thought was kind of which was kind of interesting. For sure. It's it's a whole different ball of wax. Now, did you know that uh, Sagrada came out with an app? I know. I know. And it's like, I'm kind of, it's terrible because I'm almost like, it's like, I try and stay away from doing the board game app (laughs) kind of (laughs) search on Google Play because otherwise I know I would just be, I'm going to get that one. For sure. I'm going to get that one. I'm going to get that one. And it's like, and they're just saying, well, we're making this secure because all you need to do to check out and give us money is give your fingerprint. And it's like, I know. So what you're saying is if I want this, I just need to press my thumb somewhere. And that is far too easy. You know, I should take that off and actually get me entering my password. So, yes. But have you have you been playing Sagrada then? Yeah, I have. And I've really enjoyed it. I've played some Charterstone mm-hmm. as well. I'm on that board and really enjoying that i know wingspan is going to come out on the switch hopefully in the not too distant future and that that's a great one that i'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to that blows my mind that blows my mind that wingspan is um coming to i mean it's to me is the difference between like a um being on like say steam so yeah being on steam being on the pc and being on tabletopia or tabletop simulator actually making that transition and coming along to like the Nintendo's flagship handheld. I mean, that's a huge, huge leap, you know, as far as I can see. So I'm, I'm, I've, I've not played Wingspan yet. I'm sorry. It, uh, that's, that's okay. I've only played it once. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah. What about yourself? Are you, are you looking? Are you looking? Is there anything else that you're kind of looking forward to, or you'd like to play digitally? I mean, now that the games are, I guess there's going to be games out there that are going to become more available. But is there anything you'd like to kind of get to the digital table? I guess so many. I that's that's one of the tough things. The two types of games that the two types of games I find I really enjoy as hmm. apps are. The games I can't get to the table often. So the bigger, yeah. meatier games, it's really nice to have a way to explore those, like through the ages. On the other hand, the other type of game I really, really love coming to app form are the ones that are really quick and light and simple that you can kind of breeze through. And so I'm I'm on both ends of the spectrum there. I guess the middle tier, forget y'all, who cares? <laughs> but... <laughs> I want the number one game I want to come out on an app form right now, Tiny Towns. I love Tiny Towns so much, and it just has an element that I think it would be so great in app form in terms of placing the little cubes on a board and then having them combine into buildings and covering the scoring, keeping track of the scoring for yourself and things like that, being able to play solo easily. You could play solo in real life too, and that's wonderful, but just kind of just no fuss, no must solo in digital form. That's that's my number one wish, I think, right now. Other than every Roland right that ever existed. Are, but aren't they... Isn't it pretty easy to do like a Roland right then? It should be. But th- shockingly, dismayingly, Roland rights, there's only a handful that have been officially ported over into app form. And I think Roland rights would be amazing in app form, and I think most of them should be ported over, and for whatever reason, they just haven't been, and I'm so sad about that. Because you're a big, big advocate for Roll and Write. I really enjoy them. They're one of my all-time favorite formats for for board gaming. I think it's an incredible format. I 
I have refused to get into them in a big way because of their relative inexpensiveness. And I know that if I went down that rabbit hole, then, you know, I'd be ending up sitting next to Alice and the Mad Hatter drinking tea with a pile boxes of rolling right surrounding me because I just know that's that's how I would go with it. Mm. I've played um I played uh do, 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 do. I played the King Domino one, the rolling right for that, which was Oh yeah. Very, very good fun. Yeah. You know, that was good fun. It was simple and yeah. it was fun. And I enjoyed it. And just like every other version of uh, King Domino, it was exceptionally easy to teach everybody else to play. And once they grasped it, they grasped it within five minutes, and they were, you know, and then we were kind of, then we were kind of ready, ready to go. So that was that was incredibly good, incredibly good fun. As for the rolling rights, I've not touched it. But then again, it's like I'm looking at my collection, and I'm also looking at other potential games that are going to be joining my other collection, and the number of games that I'm gonna get hold of are next to nothing now. I think I'm officially kind of starting to look over games that I have and saying, well, should I just put them on the table, set them up and give them a war, even if it's like a two-player game? Even if it doesn't have a solo variant, should I just get it to the table and have a muck around with it and see how we get on? Now is the time to clean the shelf or now is the time to learn the games that I think I should be learning instead of learning them on the night and wasting an hour of my time going through a rule book. You know, but there you go. That's so tough, though, because you're going to learn them all now, which I agree, that's the right thing to do. But then, yes, it is. flash forward, you're going to forget them all and have to do it all over again. I'm going to do I'm going to do a really bad video series, um, <laughs> which is just going to be me kind of like going, all oh, right, so that's what you're meant to do. And that's the entire premise of the show is just me learning kind of stuff. And... Uh, doing that and just you know and then filming it so I will remember it because then I can go back and I can remind myself of the time when I learned that game and then I shall be fine that's probably not going to work but you know I'm willing to give it kind of like my my best shot um what about see in terms of like general content creation have you noticed that have you know are you still steady as steady as she goes with that I mean have you noticed a slight dip in that or have you found yourself kind of creating a little bit more or had more ideas with regards to that side of things? For me, it's mostly steady. So, of course, I'm one of the co-hosts of the Dice Tower podcast, and so Mandy Mm, and I mm. do every other episode, and we're quite stable with that and quite steady with that. Although we had to Mm. make some adjustments, right, as our playgroups aren't meeting up in person and as we're all adjusting to how we get games played to talk about on a board gaming podcast, uh, we're making some adjustments (laughs) to format and things in order to accommodate kind Mm -hmm. of where we're at right now. And then we're still live streaming, which we really, really enjoy because not only do we get to play games with each other, but we also get to talk with people in the chat and have that interaction. And I think that's what in many ways so many of us are craving right now is, is human interaction. And so that really soothes that. But for sure, I see other people who are trying to crank out new content or up their content production and there's whew, no way no way I could could do more than what I'm doing with all the other adjustments but I mean you're st- you're steady on right um yeah I get I, you know what I mean I've had to be um more fl- I've had to be not more flexible I think I've had to be aware that you know, you kind of like organize things. And, and I think people think I'm quite negative because I say to folk, you know, and I've said to you, know, oh, well, if we need to reschedule and it's the last minute at all, for whatever reason, then let's do it. Because there have been cases where folk are just saying, look, I was having a nightmare day. I know that we planned this like weeks ago, but I just need to, so I, I need to be kind of, I need to move it to another day because, you know, because I think for some people, if they're in their house, sometimes it's difficult for them to get away from what they're facing. Sure. And for some people, it's just like a case, you know, I think everybody needs to just be a little tiny little bit, maybe more understanding. But um, I'm still doing that. I'm contemplating kind of, well, no, I am slowing down in the next couple of months. I'm just, I'm going to do maybe some more video stuff um, just to do something different because I think that people's, I don't, 
I think it's people's ability to be able to consume content has changed as well. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly noticed that in the podcast side of things, whereas people, you know, if people, if I was asking people about, you know, if they said, oh, I listen, it's like, all oh, right, great. That's, thank you very much. When do you listen? They say, well, I listen on my commute. And there's a lot of people now that are missing out on that hour and a half, two hour commute where they would listen to podcasts in the morning and listen to podcasts on the way home. So we've, I think the the number of kind of um, interactivity that you get with that kind of content is kind of like dipped a bit. And I think that's across the board. Um but it's, it's now a good time for me to maybe stretch and uh, see what's see what else is it because you don't know you know I'm not you know I, I think it would be just a fun thing to do you get some silly half balding Scotsman on a video trying to explain things and look intelligent I mean I I I can't see what could be more appealing than just me fumbling through a bit in a video form I you know. I'll put a content warning before, obviously, but, you know, may contain Scottishness. So there we go. Keep in mind, but maybe your audience mm. in Scotland or the UK would be limited, but a Scottish accent really sells over here in the States. So the, 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 the my biggest audience is in America. When I look at the figure, when I look at the cross section and it brings up my little map or my stats it's like it's America all the way, you know. So I really should be taking that into account. I should be really, you know, watching what I'm saying just in case I'm saying something completely, um, completely wrong, you know. Well, I was, you got I was remi- when going I was, to the store for groceries down, so you're well I on did your way. That. I did that, but there's a saying in Scot, there's a saying in Scotland, and I think, <laughs> you know, if you're gonna go out, go out with a bang. But um, there's a saying, I was having a conversation with um, one of your uh, fellow country people and um, I came up, somebody was saying, oh, did they like it? And it says they were, they were on it like a tramp on chips. <laughs> okay. Now, I don't know now, what that means. No, that just means with an eagerness. Now, a tramp over here is, a va- is like a vagabond. Okay. And chips would be fries. And chips would be fries. So it's like a Scottish saying, I was on it like a tramp on chips. As in, you know, if they saw that they would, you know, if they saw like a bag of of fries, they would be on it because it would be something to eat kind of thing. But then somebody advised me that a tramp is generally a very bad derogatory term for a woman. (laughs) And that chips are generally like crisps. Correct. So that was an education basically. So sometimes things don't translate and sometimes they do translate. So that is why I've got to be aware. So yes, I might potentially do, I might potentially do more videos, but we'll, we shall, we shall see. But um, this is not about me. It's all about you. Mm. So um, when are you next streaming? I guess is the next question. And where can we find you when you are next streaming? Well, Mandy and I are streaming about every other week, sometimes a little more often if mm-hmm. we are in the mood, on the Dice Towers YouTube yeah. channel. And right now we're playing cool. our show Aptastic, which has us playing yes. board game apps against each other. And we, I, we're, we're a little competitive with each other. So uh, I think our next episode, we're talking about resolving a couple of grudge matches that we need to resolve because we tied... In our Shards of Infinity and Mystic Veil vale series episodes. And so we have to resolve those ties. And so I think that's what we'll do for our next episode is have our Mystic Veil vale and Shards <laughs> of Infinity grudge match. I, I, I think that's definitely um, worthwhile uh, checking out. And in general, if people want to find out what's going to happen on day 38, 39, 40 and 41... Of adventures in uh, homeschooling, and where do they? Where will they go? Where will they find you on the internet webs? I'm very active on Twitter. My account is at four two five Suzanne, and that's where I'm sharing my regular bemoaning of life right now. And <laughs> if they want to find me on Board Game Geek. My username there is Gibbous, G-I-B-B-O-U-S. 
And they're always welcome to email me at 425susanne at gmail. There you go. There you go. And we shall make sure that we shall put all those links in the show. Well, no, what will happen is it will be a case of me going to the last show notes, pressing Control A, pressing Control C, going over to the new show notes, pressing Control V, and copying them across, I think. Because I'm kind of efficient and lazy like that. I appreciate you taking me on the journey with you, though. (laughs) It's like, there's like just that little bit of extra information that I didn't need to know. Um, But yeah, we'll put them, as I say, we'll put them in the show notes so that we have got notes to show. If you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, go to the Google search for We're Not Wizards and you'll find us in all the different places. Um, If you want to listen to us, go to wearenotwizards.com. If you want to read our blog, go to wearenotwizards.co.uk. If you want to find us anywhere else, Instagram and Facebook, and you can also find us on the podcast catcher of choice. Simple as that. And tell people about us as well, you know, because we like to spread like butter, as they would say. Um, But thank you very, very much for coming on. This has been um, very, very interesting indeed. Yeah, it's it's tough times. And I know some people want to escape from all the virus news, but sometimes it's cathartic to talk about it as well and listen to people talk about it. So thank you for having me on. Yeah. I really appreciate it. It's always, it's nice just to chat. It's nice to chat to an adult. Yeah, so thank you for that opportunity, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That's, I think, the, probably the third time in my life I've been called an adult. <laughs> um, you know, so there you go. Um, but there's only there's only one more thing to do. It's a big, huge goodbye from Suzanne. Say goodbye, Suzanne. Goodbye, Suzanne. And it's a big, huge goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, stay at home. Rule six is make something awful. But until the next time, go digital and goodbye. Wizard is never linked. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to.